What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and definitely leave a comment. Because everybody's been asking me about Jimmy and we didn't get to the Cowboys and some of the violence that he had experienced in prison, we had to bring this brother back on, man. Machiavelli, you know, Jimmy, man, listen, the people already know who you are, man, so we're going to get right to it, bro. How you feeling today? I feel good, brother. I went through a lot of stuff the last few days, man, just on some personal level, but man, you know, it's good, man. Everybody, I'm pretty sure everybody's going to come out stronger. Well, man, I hope so. I know you're living in that assisted living and, you know, they had a fight over there. There, People were beefing. They had some stuff going on, man. So, you know, hopefully that stuff's getting worked out and, and things, will, things will be better it's for good, you. Man. It's just a bunch of alpha male. It's just a bunch of alpha male men living together, bro. It's, it's kind of hard, man. Let me ask you about that, man. Do you feel like uh, do you feel like you're back in prison living in that place, bro? No, you know, well, uh, really, the reality of that, I love that feeling here because everywhere else I was, that was the thing that I wasn't accepted about. And, and when I got in here, everybody not has only been to the joint, but everybody is the caliber of a convict. You know what I mean? So, you know, we are bumping some heads over some just – some nonsense stuff right now, but you know, that's what happens at times, man. But everybody here, when we're on some uh, neutral time, man, it's a good house, man. It's a good house, bro. Believe me, I, I fought tooth and nail to make sure I wasn't getting kicked out the last couple of days, but uh, it's all good. It's all going to work out. That's what's up. So let me ask you. You know, we had left off. We started to talk about the Cowboys a little bit, and you know who they were and what they were doing, man. Tell the people about the Cowboys, man. When you were in federal prison. Well, the Cowboys, a lot of people, when I, when I tell them about it out here, you know, they, they, they like listening to my war stories and, and my, my institutional life. And when I get to that, they, a lot of them really don't believe that it's true. But then all they got to do is look it up on the phone. I'm even listed in as a class action lawsuit that one of the victims of it was happening to. And it was not only happening as a victim, like, you know, you get beat up or, or, or smashed out here or there, and then you get over it. This ha this continued for years, and it got worse and worse and worse. Um, I would say, man, I can't remember what year it actually started, but the, these four or five officers that were, were actually in charge of ADX, which is an entity of its own self, within the federal maximum penitentiary system, uh, they, they, they had the keys to everything in there. They were the God, they were the God. And at first everything ran smooth because that was a newly opened prison at the time. Everything ran smooth, but as they became drinking buddies and as they become watching them do things that were against policy and against the law, and they accepted it, they formed together as a brotherhood. And then that turned into an actual game because they had got tattoos of the Viking um, the, I'm not big into sports, but the biking symbol with the guy with the, the biking with the beard or whatever, mm -hmm. and they got it all on their ankles. And that was their patch. Like we had our patches, but they were, they were into like some really torturous stuff, man. They, I, there was a time for, I would say a two year fan were about every month or so. If you argued with one of them, there was a chance that they would come and team you that night, late that night. And when they came, they would just, you know, you'd be reading a book or drawing or sleeping or exercising and your door, you have two different doors. You have a solid door that protects them from the hall. And then about six feet in, then you have a rack of bars that lock that off. So they would, they would open that first door and they would tell you, you're going to get one chance back up to the bars. You're getting chained up. Well, why am I getting chained up? What you're not even supposed to leave these cells. Why am I getting chained up? Where am I going? We're going to take you to the law library. We want to search your cell. And at that point, you have to do, you have to submit to that direct order. You don't even have to talk to the warden by law, but or SIS or the gang units or anything. You do not have to talk to them. You have that right not to. But when they say we're going to search you and your cell, you have to submit to that demand order. And immediately, or it comes into where they shoot you with a paintball gun, which hurts you, it, believe me, it leaves bruises on you. And they aim for your genital areas and your face. And it's a game to them. And they're only supposed to, by policy, shoot you up to 15 times. They'll shoot, they shot me over 70 times at one time. 
because I didn't want to come out. I knew what was going to happen. I and mean, they would, they wouldn't take us to the law library. They would drag you off down to the, um, uh, it was a, like a suicide cell and they had a hard cement bed in the middle of the floor with, with, with a spread Eagle ankles. So you were, so what you're saying, Jimmy, is this, they would take you down to these four point cells, handcuff you one arm to one side, one arm to the other, both legs, one side over here, one side over there. And they four point you and do what? They would, they would four-point us, and they would give you a warning. Because by now, we have known, what the, what, once you're getting four-pointed, you're just hoping that it ain't going to get worse, you know? And you're and you're working out, you're tough, and you're almost per, uh, bowing down to their game, you know? And they would tell you, when it count to three, punch in the stomach, see if it knocks the wind out of you, you know? And it'd be the first one wouldn't be that hard. Then, bam! And then that would tighten you up for a minute. But, but after about six or seven of them, man, you're just begging them to take you back to the rack. Well, then, if you got to the point where you spit on them or, or, or threatened them or anything like that, when they would, when they would sell them, they, then they would punch you in the face, things like that. Sometimes they wouldn't even put you in the four-point thing. They would put the handcuffs behind you and just run your face into the wall, stuff like that. And in the morning, the PA would come to give you your medicine or whatever, and the PA would look at you and go, what, what, how did that happen? And the cop would laugh and go, Oh, he's banging his head on the wall again. He knows he's crazy. And the and the guy and the PA would say something like, You shouldn't do that. Be careful. Blah, blah, blah. And as they were walking away, they both start laughing because they have a they have a bond in there within themselves. If one of them were to start saying something or going against the tide, they would get astronaut or whatever it's called. Um they would get they would they would have a hard time at work, man. They'd have their they, they, they cut each other's fly, uh, tires out on the parking lot, spit on their windshields, and you know it gets, gets messed up when when you're on that status. It's being on status, and so they all if they don't participate in it, they look they look the other way. Yeah. So this continued for years, and um, it, we for a long time we complained about it and wrote letters to the ACLU and uh, Prison Project. And things like that, and they couldn't get nowhere with it because it was the the prison in itself was the most secure prison. The most they got Chapo there, they got the Unabomber there, they had uh 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 Barry Mills, um uh all of them. They have they have a lot of high power guys there, man. They got people that I've never even heard their name on um, mobsters and and uh, terrorists and stuff. But it's such an isolated entity of a of an institution that nobody can ever get in. They would have to get permission to do a tour through there, and then they would just drill them down the halls that they wanted them to, and you pretty much knew better than to get up on that door and try to complain. <clears throat> but anyways, it took another officer to actually start contacting the FBI and giving them these horror stories and telling them, look, man, uh, you guys gotta do something about this because I'm not gonna work here much longer. And when that happens, these guys are being killed and, and several people committed suicide just over the years of abuse and the years of torture that they went through from these eight or so officers. Now, this is a true. This is what I'm telling you is the truth. And if anybody doubts it, all they got to do is Google it up. Two of the officers have already been convicted and sent to prison. And, you know, hopefully on that class action lawsuit, which my lawyer said, it could take years and years before it's all done and said. So um, it's it actually happened. And, you know, that's the Cowboys in, in, in a nutshell. I mean, I could tell you other things that they did. They they urinated in people's trays. Uh, they spit loogies right in. I remember one time when they did your tray, Chad. Chad remember? Yeah. Remember? They said, dude. He put and the hot dog. Dirty, man. But anyway, he took the hot dog and put huh? the meatballs next to the hot dog. The and meatballs and the banana drip, drip out. Hey, that's what they do to us. People don't believe it, man. They treat us like that. They're supposed to be in there to protect us, to make sure we don't hurt each other, to make sure we don't hurt them, and to make sure that we don't go crazy. Yeah. But they don't do none of that. None of it. And they have absolutely no rehabilitation in the maximum federal prison system. You talked about Barry Mills, right? So let's talk about Barry Mills for a minute. All right. I, I grew up with Barry. Oh, so you know Barry personally. 
I knew Barry. I didn't know Barry in the feds because he was slammed all that time when I was still on uh, general population. I knew Barry Mills was he was in California. The, Tell the people. The, hold on. Hold on. Tell the people who Barry Mills is. Barry Mills was was a shot caller out of the Aryan Brotherhood from California, the State Yard, and um, they did a when they came out with the RICO that was actually going after the mobsters, a joint of people that was collecting money on criminal behavior became the RICO, which became life sentences, basically. Um, they brought them to court on a RICO for extortion in the prison system, extort, uh, extorting the officers, putting hits for hire. And uh, when they got convicted, that's a federal crime. So it brought him into the feds. So when he, when he came into the feds and... Um, uh, uh, T.D. Bigham and Hawk and Slug and all the other ones because they were all on the same case. Matter of fact, they were in a case that a dude that both me and you despised that was in my clique was was Michael Bridge. He's the one who blew the whistle and got the RICO Act throwing it down on the table. And anyways, uh, so when they came over, they formed another branch of Aryan Brotherhood, which Aryan Bro- their Aryan Brotherhood used to only be California with the exception of a rule once in a great while. But in the feds, it was an exception of the rule a lot of the time because the feds is a geographical melting spot, which is that's why it makes it so violent and so unnecessary with violence because it's just like me and you thought me and you would never be friends because you're from New York and I'm from California and we immediately hit a yard. We're supposed to hurt each other. And that's the thing. We're just pulling the best out of every state. And he, he formed a very, very, very dangerous, very dangerous brand within the federal system. And that's why he, they slammed him for 20-something years before he finally died in a cell. And the same with T.D. Bigham, which T.D. Bigham, I think he got, oh, no, um, which one was, had the 37 years of lockdown. Uh, you were talking about him on one of your shows. Silverstein. So, Tommy Silverstein. All of them, that was one crew. That was one crew that used to be in Leavenworth. There's a book called, wrote called The Hot House, and that talks about Terry Bills and, and uh, T.D. Bigham. And that, them guys used to be the guys in the chow hall. Them guys used to be the guys at the handball court. And them guys, hand they, they were masterminds of violence, manipulation, and, and extortion, and, and they picked the best out of everybody they could on the yard. And they, no, they had to build a prison like ADX, to, to confine them, and they still couldn't control them. That's how they were. So you say he picked the best. So when you mean the best, you mean the most violent, the dudes that were balls to the wall, didn't really care, do whatever they wanted to do. Actually, no, that, 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 that's a statement because that's why I have so much respect for Terry Bills. I mean, T.D. Bigham and, and Barry Mills and, and uh, Tommy Silverstein and all the rest of them because you had to be – everything across the board you had to be a good politician you had to be a friendly person you had to be a gentleman you had to be educated and you had to be a killer and you had you know you had to have it all if you didn't have the whole package you didn't even get in your hand they weren't putting their hand up for you you know it got watered down nowadays but they're still dangerous because they're still living under the coattails of, of that reputation but i'm gonna tell you Ben, they were the, they were the guys man they were the guys they were, they were the closest thing the, to the Emmy, you know? Let me ask you this. So we're talking about the Aryan Brotherhood, but tell me who you think the top prison gangs are, most dangerous. Oh, well, I would say the one that, that I recognize from the violence and from being on the yards the way they were and becoming friends with them and doing a lot of lockdown time with them as well, I would say the NF, man. The NF is our enemies. I... Me being a Nazi lowrider and 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 uh, and the brand being our, our big homies, and then us having the allies of the Emmy, which is the Mexican mafia, and then all their soldiers, Serenios and Southsiders, they were our enemies. And you know, you would think uh, the Emmy and all them guys were the most killer, and they are. They got a lot of power, but them NFs, they wasn't playing when they came into that on that. Re- they came in under the Black Widow Rico Act. And when they came in, oh man, they they slaughtered dudes on every yard, every yard. 
Um, I would say them out of my own person thing. But if I had to go with my heart, it would be the Emmy, man. It would be the Emmy, the Southsiders, the AB. You know, you're always going to go with your heart. But, like, I mean, you know, you're an exception to my rule. I mean, I've seen you. You're a masterminder. You're a tough-ass dude. You know what I mean? I, you had it across the board. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it gives and chooses. You know, it's, it doesn't. If you're going to go for numbers, you're going to go for the for the Emmy and the Southsiders and the NF and the North Daniels and, and things like that. But I would rather take a crew like this house. This house is, you know, there's eight of us in here. Eight, or, There's eight of us and a lady in here. And let me tell you something, man. Uh, I would rather have these eight dudes as my friends and my backup than 50 dudes that are half tough. You know what I mean? And yeah. half dumb, you know? I and you. so I would say the little, the littler numbers though, it would be dudes like us, man. Dudes that all get along, man, and got each other's backs. That's where my heart's really gonna go. What's up? I hear that, but so let me tell you, let me ask you this. So let's say the black hand, right, Mexican mafia tells one of the homies, hey, kill this dude or kill the warden. Does it matter? Or will they do it? Or just be like, I ain't doing that. Uh you're talking about one of their own soldiers? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the 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 Mexican ones. They, they're pretty much born and bred to take the orders of their big homie. No matter what it is, they can go home tomorrow, go kill the dude, and they usually do. But, you know, I mean, uh, the ones that they really look for, if you're in a gang and you want to send a hit out and make a statement, you don't want to look bad in it. So you're going to pick your choice soldiers. And they're usually the ones that's got their hand up. And, if, and, and uh, if they don't, you're punishing the dude. If you want to see the dude get in a wreck, you make him go do it, and then everybody on the yard knows it too. So he was crash dummy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, yeah. You be with the with the NF and the Emmy. All their soldiers are going on site, on call. All right. So you also talked about Mills. He had a lot of power, right? He had a lot of power. Yeah. You both see the thing is that made them so so unique is uh, Tommy Silverstein, Terry Bills. Uh, Mary Bills and uh, T.D. Bigham, they were the shot callers over the entire federal prison system, which is the United States of America and California. And see, a lot of people think everybody that's from California, when you go to prison, you're all gang members. You're not. If you're white, there's only three gangs in the state of California prison system. That's all. They don't allow no other gangs. If you try to start a gang, you get hurt. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that. They just think they, we are gang members out on the streets. Then we come in, that's left at the gate. If you want to prospect and you want to get tipped up, there's only three gangs from, and you, they got to choose you. You know what I mean? What gangs? But that's what made them so you, they were, they were over both. They were over everything. What gangs, Jimmy? You had the AB, which is the big homies, the Nazi lowriders, and then you had the P9 skins. And the reason they did that is because at one time the brand was on the yard. They ran the yard. They ran everything from renting cells to protecting people to getting dope in to turning over cops, turning cops out to bring them stuff. So they ended up doing what they did to them in the federal prison system is they slammed them. And uh, they slammed them, slammed them down. That's what they do to their problems. That's what they did to me for eleven straight years. You know, let they me take see. you away from everything and everything. Let me let Wait me ask you. Let me ask you if you remember this kid. He had a life sentence uh -huh. out of Las Vegas. He was in Arizona with us. The ball head white dude. He came to the hole when we were down there. He uh, his real name was Aaron, and he ended up yeah. becoming he ended up becoming a booty bandit, bro. He was had an Indian dude that was his girlfriend. You remember that white dude? Oh man! Oh no! Uh, you're talking about um, uh, he was a skinhead. Yeah, that was the one. Of the, oh my god, dude! It's funny you say that. I might have told you this in the past. That was my target. I was supposed to hit that dude when he was an active skinhead. Let me tell you something, dude. That that was one. I don't got a big fear button in me, man. And that, that's probably what's going to get me beat up and fucking and stabbed up and shot and killed. One of these days, not that I want that life anymore, but I don't have that big fear button. And I ain't no tough guy or anything, but I'm going to tell you something. 
I was, that was my talk through my, my, my people telling me what I had to do. And I used to be scared, man, when I hit a new yard, man. I'm like, man, is that that dude on the yard? Because that dude got you on site. He was hitting brand dudes in Marion. Yeah, you know what I mean? Him. I mean, that dude was no punk by any means. But then he went to Arizona and fell in love with that, that Indian kid. But, yeah, he's probably one of the most dangerous. He put in more work than I did. I know that. And I put in a lot of work. And that's one thing. Look, I was with him in Big Sandy, right? And oh, Shane or Kane. 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 That was that's what they called him. His real name was Aaron. His parents were out of Vegas. He was a skinhead over there. Yeah. He had killed a dude. Had life in Vegas. Had life in the feds. And man, he said he said talk to his cellies and torture him. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about him for a minute. So a lot of people might have watched that movie American History X. When that dude came into the prison system. He was on that American History X movie stuff where, like, if you're a white man, you don't play softball with any black dudes. You don't do this. Yeah, you don't do that. that. So, I and, days. Huh? I remember the days. I never contributed to that behavior. I, I like I fuck with everybody, bro. Even when I was running around with with all of my uh, offending stuff, that was never in my heart, man. I grew up in L.A., man. I grew up around blacks, Mexicans, everything. I went to school with them. I went to... I hung out at the beach with them. I fought with them. I fought against them. I fought with them. But but um, uh, he tried to pull that's really <clears throat> going against the grain because not hardly anybody does that in there. Come softball season, that's what you do. You get out there and you want to wreck against another because it puts even more, uh, um, uh, you know, sporting to it. You know what I mean? This but yeah, he wanted to pull that stuff. He he pulled that shit in Pollock. Louisiana. Yeah, so this is the thing, though, what I was going to say, Jimmy, because now we, you know, you, you, we both know who we're talking about. This dude was a complete gangster, bro, and he would kill you in a minute. Wouldn't even think about it, man. I, I, I seen him take the chain off and beat a dude with the cuffs on in, in R&D, and then I had seen him in Arizona, and they had their little, this is when all this gay stuff was starting, they had their little meeting, and they got together, and he, uh, he was at that little, like, get-together. I was like, Dude, what's up? And he was like, "Dude, I don't know what's up." But I'm like, "What happened with hey, this guy?" I, I, I actually know the inside story to that too, man. I want to know what it the, is. The people huh? want to know. Well, I'm going to tell them. Uh, he was in the shoe doing a lot of downtime, and and he was depressed. And uh, some young kid moved in his room with them. And they became good friends, and he confided in them about a body that was out on the streets. That was a body that was in Vegas that was buried in the sand. And that kid went to the FBI and told him, I know where there's a body where you let me out of prison if I testify. And that put him in there on a life sentence. And when he got that life sentence, it did something to his head. All he wanted to do was either kill or fall in love with somebody. And he was doing both of them. That's, that's how that really went down. That's what happened. He confided in some a, a roommate, and that roommate uh, told on him. And that, I mean, it, that might have always been him, and maybe that's why he was so violent because he couldn't stand the fact that he was gay or whatever, this or that. Uh -huh. And uh, I'll tell you, I don't know what it, I can't call that. I just know the reason, the excuse he was giving everybody. Yeah, he was a he was definitely a dangerous dude, man. Yeah, not too many people wanted to mess with him, though. I mean, or mess with his kid because uh, that that's one of the – and that was just a skinny little kid, man. That was one of the most dangerous dudes in the system. Do you remember the kid, the kid from New York? He might have been in Pollock with you, man. He was from New York, Hell's Kitchen. I can't remember this kid's name, man. He Jeremy Bender. Do you remember Jeremy Bender? I, that name rings a bell, man, but you got to give me an incident that was he was involved. All right, I'm going to tell you. He stabbed the dude in Pollock, and then the dude from po the dude left Pollock went to Coleman, too. He was shining on the toilet before the trial. He was going to testify on Jeremy Bender, and he electrocuted himself. Yeah, yeah I knew him. Yeah. Jeremy yeah, Bender? That, you know, they, had the, they had the stinger hooked out of the, the metal of the toilet. And they were drinking at Mont Moonshine, which is 100% alcohol, called Idiot Hall. And uh, he went to sit down to just sit down to relax or to use the bathroom and <clears throat> turned into a skeleton right there on the spot. 
And, you know, end of the story, he wasn't able to come testify on Jeremy Bender for stabbing him at Pollock. Yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was one of the highlights out of it. Yeah. There's all, so much crazy shit. And, you know, like, that's why you were able to write a book truthfully. You know, your book's a true book, right? A nonfiction? Yeah, of course. The book I'm going to write, it's going to be called On, On Death's Bloody Trail. And it's just my story of going through the system, what I had to, what I had to do, what I, what I wanted to do, what I participated in, what I did myself. You know, it's just a lot of violence over nothing, man. It's just unnecessary. It got so bad. Uh, Chad, when I first went into the system, if two dudes were fighting and one got knocked down, the dude let me have a second to get up, you know? I watched it go from that to four dudes standing around the dude with they've already plotted out. They all got steel toe boots on and they're just stomping the dude's brains out. Then I went from that to taping up knives in your hands and running in the cell, stabbing the dude as many times as you can till your arms sore. I mean, uh, it went from that to go stab the warden, stab the warden 27 times. That happened in Victorville. You know what I mean? It's just like the violence fight in the white race was the most vicious race on their own in that entire federal prison system. People don't realize that. You mean that, so, you know, I don't want people to think different than what you said, but you said the most vicious on their own where they would, whites would brutalize whites. Yeah, for no reason, for no reason. I mean, they're just, because somebody didn't like somebody or, 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 or somebody did something that, you know, it wasn't a stabbing offense, you know, it was a sit down and talk offense. And then from there, if it, if, it can, if it continued, then, you know, maybe send a couple dudes up and beat them up so he understands it, not do that. Or, but not jump right to the gun and just stab them up. Crazy. Hey, I know there was an incident. You're from California. You grew up on the West Coast. You're, you're a Cali dude. Wasn't there an incident in Victorville, I think, where they cut the dude's head off or something? No, that happened to uh, uh, David Snow. Couldn't happen to a better guy, you know? That dude got so many dudes effed up, man. That they made that dude ban. A B. And when he got that power on that yard, anybody he didn't like, he just pointed his finger like he was a king, and they just the kids there, it doesn't matter who or where from. If there's one A B dude on that yard, he controls every white dude on that yard. Rather you like it or not. And if you don't like it, then you get that finger pointed at you. Yeah, he did and a lot he of got, he did a he lot got of a bad good friend shit. Of mine's. So, Jimmy, how did they kill Snow? Well, um, Snow Snow got voted in on, on, on the most serious game. He did a lot of things wrong that led up. Like, when we were in the SMU program in Lewisburg that held 17 game members all at once, uh, he was asked to hold a knife that he refused to hold on to. That right in itself would get you killed in that type of game. But he did so many other things. He treated a lot of people bad. He had a lot of people hurt over nothing. Um, when it came time for them to get him, they rocked him to sleep. He thought their, their problems of sitting down at the table and, and hashing things out with them. He thought that was over, and, and they, they rocked him to sleep, talking about he thought everything was all right. And they creeped up in his cell on him real quick, gaffled him up, tied him up, sat him down, sat on him, and slowly poke one of his eyes out. When they took the first eye out, he was going hysterical, begging him to stop. When they took the second eye out, he realized he didn't have eyes anymore. And he started begging them just to kill him. But they want to do it like that. They want to do it slower because they, this, at this point, Victor Bill needed a real statement because the, the Emmy was getting all the credit and all the spotlights for all their hits. And the brand was starting to look watered down and weak. So what happened was a brand, when they got their choice to get one, especially one of their own, to show all the other games what they'll do to their own. So you better watch out. You imagine what we'll do to you. It was that kind of a statement. They overkilled him. They cut his head off. They took cut his head completely off of his shoulders. They stabbed him under the armpits with our, our murder hits. Murder. You can't survive under or one stab under the armpits. You cannot survive. Um, they stabbed him probably 20, 30 times under each eye, uh, under each armpit. And when them autopsy reports come out, 
they list exactly how many times a person stabs. So that becomes like credible, credible paperwork towards the game's reputation. Like in mind, when I got, when I got, uh, God, it's been so long. I almost forget his name. Uh, uh, that's crazy. Um, uh, they had to circle every, every mark I made on the dude. You know what I mean? So I know that for a fact, and I know that's why them gangs get those uh, autopsy reports with the discovery. And that becomes part of their, their, you know, their, 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 their trophies to shine in their games. So anyways, yeah, he got stabbed 20, 30 times under each armpit, but before they hit the armpits, they cut his patch while he was still alive off of his side, stuck it on the shower. I mean, stuck it on the locker door. Um, it's a vicious world in there, man. It's, it's a place that if anybody's listening to this year's show, if anybody's got any type of IQ and actually listens to it and realizes this is true stuff. This is nothing made up, man. Even your show is your questions are just thrown at me randomly. Um, it's not a place you want to go, man. And, you know, I advise anybody, man, if they're, if they're doing anything wrong, man, find yourself, man. Get yourself back in gear, man. Be, some, be, be an asset to society. Because if you become a cancer, man, there's judges are just going to cut you out and put you right in those places. For sure. Listen, man, I'm going to close the show, right? I know your camera's getting a little messed up, but I'm going to close the show. And just, man, again, man, I want people to know that, that prison is real, Jimmy. And what you just said, hey, get yourself back in gear, man. That's yeah. important. And, uh, you know, Jimmy's living in, yeah. in this Jimmy's living in this house over here. You know, it's not easy. Dude, some dudes reached out to me, said they wanted you to hook them up with some skateboards. I told people to hit your cash app. I'm going to put that in, in the description, man. You know, anything to help Jimmy out, man, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he'll appreciate it, man. I don't care if it's five bucks, ten bucks. You know, the same way we came together to help them guys in Columbia. If you guys want to help Jimmy out, man, we're going to have his cash app up there on the on the video. And, you know, that's what's up, man. It don't have to be an every month thing, but if someone wants to look out, we're asking you to look out for Jimmy, man. Trying to get on his feet. He's had some issues at that house. Wants to try to tr get his own apartment. He's trying to get a job, so don't think he's not trying to get a job. He's trying to do everything he can to get the hell out of there and, and be independent, man, and live on his own and not have to feel like he's living in a jail cell still. So, you know, with that, Jimmy, man, I just want to say thank you, man. I appreciate you. You bring it real. You bring it raw. You tell the truth. You live that life, man. This stuff ain't made up. This is real life. Blood on the Razor Wire TV, man. Until tomorrow, we're out. Thank you.